Welcome, Justin Bryan, to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for coming on, spending a little bit of time with us today. Today, I have you on as a motivational speaker and life coach. Life coach, motivational speaker, they're just names that we just give something that's so much more. And today we're going to be diving into those two roles that you do and how you help people. But without me telling your whole story, please tell the people who you are, what you do and how you help. Well, my name is Justin Bryan. I am a mental health advocate and inspirational speaker and a life coach. But like, as you said, they are names to be able to put those, let's say titles in front of my name. I had a 16 year long battle with alcohol abuse. A uh, ten-year battle with drug abuse, and I spent a big chunk of my life struggling with depression. To where at 28 years old, I was actually diagnosed with clinical depression or major depression, which is a sadness that persists for longer than two weeks at a time. Unfortunately for me, um, I dealt with it since I was a kid. Then at 28, I was also diagnosed with um, anxiety, social and general anxiety, to where I would actually have an algorithm of how many drinks I would have before I left my house to you know, hang out with friends, to go and play sports, uh, to talk to a girl if I went out. At 30, I was diagnosed with ADHD. That's Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, which made it very difficult or let's say challenging to be more present and pay attention to those conversations I was having. So all of a sudden, you know, my mind would start to start to wander. All of a sudden, the anxiety starts and then it triggers my depression. And then all of a sudden, I'm drinking more to calm myself down and, you know, just deal with my nerves. Now, if you pair all those diagnoses with substance abuse, well, it's a recipe for a disaster. And at 28, when I finally asked for help, I became suicidal for six straight years. Now, it's not like I wanted to die, but I wanted the pain to end. And people ask me, well, Justin, what is that pain? I tell them, well, imagine a friend, a person, or a loved one just sitting in front of you and they're choking. And you see they're choking. And you see the object that they're choking on. So all you have to do is you got to reach in there and just grab it and pull it out. And you save their life. Well, unfortunately, every time you go to reach it, you can't get it. And you keep trying and you keep trying. And unfortunately, you just can't get it. And then all of a sudden you see them, you know, their life withering away. And you just sit back and all of a sudden you're, you feel useless, helpless, and hopeless. Well, that's what I felt like every day. You know, when I was, when I can look back on it now, I can pinpoint now that I know more about mental health, depression, and, you know, mental illnesses and stuff like that, I can kind of start to pinpoint, you know, where it started. And I realized that as a kid, you know, I struggled with self-confidence, uh, self-esteem, self-worth. You know, I was, uh, I was a late bloomer, I guess you could say. You know, when everyone's, everybody started to hit puberty and all the guys' voices were starting to change and everyone's starting to grow, you know, here's me. I ain't going anywhere. <laughs> I'm still stuck at the same height. I think I was, I was under four feet in grade eight. You know, everyone's everyone's voice is changing. Mine's staying the same. It's still a little girly and a little high pitched. You know, I would phone my buddy on the phone and his mom would actually answer the phone and she would be like, hey, Kelvin, it's either Justin or a girl on the phone. And I'd be like, what? I can hear you. Shot to the ego. It really, it hurt. You know, I was cut from, you know, my, my a rep team growing up in hockey and I had to watch my friends come to school in their jerseys and, you know, that kind of hurt. But I was also smaller, and, you know, with those all those insecurities that I had, you know, I always tried to act out in school. You know, I always tried to be the funny man because I wanted to be noticed and I wanted to be liked by everybody. You know, I, I put everybody on a pedestal because I just, I thought everybody was better than me and I always felt less than. So I kept acting out. And then I'd get made fun of a lot. Like I had friends, you know, I had a lot of friends, but I was made fun of a lot. And I don't think it was to, you know, tear me down or anything. It was kids being kids. And, you know, I probably <laughs> brought a lot of it on by, you know, acting out a lot. And it got to the point where I would start to eventually to, you know, join in, you know, and make fun of myself a lot too. But when you start to do that, you know, I started to, you know, turn those thoughts and those jokes into beliefs, right? And those beliefs about myself became truths. And so I started to believe all those jokes and things that were being said about me when, you know, they were probably weren't said out of, you know, trying to bring me down, like I said. But then what I did with those insecurities and those beliefs about myself is, you know, I, I opened up a bag. It was a vi visible imaginary bag. You know, I put this low self-esteem, low self-worth and low self-confidence in there. And I zipped it back up and I put it on my back. You know, I went through school with it, you know, through elementary, through junior, through high school. And when I got out, you know, around 18, 19, I moved away to play hockey. 
And then I, my, my drinking picked up, you know, cause that bag started to get heavy. So what did I do? Well, I opened up that bag and instead of unpacking everything, I actually started to put you know, anger, depression, drugs, alcohol, and suicidality in that bag. And I zipped it back up and put it on my back. Now, you know, I was on my report cards growing up. I was the bubbly kid, you know, but when I started playing junior hockey, my, by my last year, I was fighting and I wasn't, I wasn't that kind of guy, but I was angry and I was starting to become a person that I, I had no idea who I was becoming. And then by the time, you know, I, I was done hockey, I moved down by the time I was 21 years old, I was a full blown alcoholic. You know, I, I still remember sitting in junior hockey, like my first craving for a beer, you know, I was having a beer with a couple of buddies and all of a sudden I'm like, I really want one more. And I had no idea why. I'm like, I just want one. I just, I hope he finishes his so he can offer me another one. You know, and that just developed over time to where at 21, I was a full-blown alcoholic. I didn't drink much in high school. You know, I wasn't, you know, I drank like, you know, a handful of times, you know, go to the party and I would go with my four pack of Mike's Heart Lemonade and a Red Solo Cup. So no one drunk, saw me drinking, you know, some ciders, but I would drink three of them maybe, right? And I'd give the other ones away. But when I got out of high school and into around 21, I started to realize what alcohol was giving me. You know, it was giving me confidence, self-esteem, and self-worth. But what I didn't realize that everything it was giving me was fake. But soon, everything I started to take away from me was very real. By the time I'm 24 years old, I'm drinking pretty much every single day. And I'm bartending downtown Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And there's two pivotal moments that I believe stand out for me and help put me on trajectory of where I went in life. Now, when I was bartending, I was able to close up the bar within 15, 20 minutes, have my cash out done, everything wiped, everything stocked. And I did that so I could get out for power, half hour, power hour, whatever you want to call it, and have as many drinks as I could and get drunk by myself. You know, go visit the bartenders. You know, I like to think I was going to visit people, but I was literally going out by myself to get drunk. And then I would walk home. And on my way home, I'd phone up, dial a bottle, and I'd have more alcohol waiting for me when I got home, right? So I could continue my drinking. You know, alcohol became my best friend. One night, a bartender came up to me and said, Justin, can I ask you something? I'm like, sure, man. He said, do you think you're an alcoholic? Or do you think you, sorry, he said, do you think you drink too much? And I said, no, there's no way I drink too much. You know, I'm young and I like to have fun. And I blew him off with what I should have done is I should have listened to him because I knew that he was actually an ex-alcoholic and I knew his story and why he didn't drink. But I did whatever, what I did every single night. I closed up the bar, went out for power hour, you know, got as drunk as I could and then walked home, phoned, dialed a bottle for more alcohol. But on this way home, a thought ran through my head and it was his voice. And it's like, Justin, you think you drink too much? And I was like, nah, I'm young. I like to have fun. I live in a big, beautiful city and I'm a bartender. There's no way I drink too much. So I took a couple more steps and a couple more steps. And then all of a sudden I got this thought, it says, Justin, are you an alcoholic? All of a sudden I got this warm feeling rush through my body. And I said this word for word. I'm like, you know what? There's no way you're an alcoholic. You go to work, you pay your bills. You're not a low life and you're too smart to be an alcoholic. I was so smart that... I graduated from alcohol abuse to drug abuse. At 24, I did cocaine for the very first time. And I didn't remember the night because I drank so much. Now, I phoned my buddy and I asked him what happened. And he told me. He's like, yeah, and you, you did drugs. Us. And I'm like, oh, man. It's not like I was against anybody else doing them. But for me, I'm like, no. I, it was a strict no. Stay away from them. But I did them. But then he said something to me that... You probably shouldn't say to a person that had my mindset. And he was like, man, you were funny last night. All right. Then and there clicked, man. I got alcohol for confidence. I got drugs to be funny. You know, I got Michael's special juice from Space Jam. One shot of this and I'm super Justin. But I can tell you, I was the only one that thought I was super Justin. So about six months after that, I moved back home. And I'm managing a nightclub and I had to get a ride home from a buddy of mine. And the topic of depression came up. And what do I know about depression? I'm 37 now. This is 13 years ago uh, where mental health wasn't recognized as much. So where I looked at him and I said this, you know, depression is an excuse. Depression is for the week. You got to man up. You got to go to work. You got to pay your bills. 
right? And I don't know why I said it back then, um, but I know why I said it now. It's because I still had that feeling of less than, you know, because I was struggling so much on the inside that I wanted to look stronger on the outside. So 24 years old, two major problems. Substance abuse, my mental health. At 24 years old, I'm ignoring two major problems, my substance abuse and my mental health. So it took me four years, four years of the same decisions, the same choices, the same spiraling, you know, moving from city to city, chasing bartending jobs, you know, getting fired, you know, getting let go because I was drunk on shift or I didn't show up to finally ask for help. I'm 20 years old. Like I said before, I finally asked for help. I finally said, Justin, you know what, man, you, uh, you're you depressed. Justin, you know, you're, you abuse substances. Okay, cool. What do I do next? Oh, well, I had to ask for help. And I, you know, I really asked for help. I've been to over 100 doctor's appointments. I spent 77 days in rehab away from my family. I've been to 45 addiction appointments, uh, 18 psychologist appointments, 10 psychiatrists. I've tried eight different meds from antidepressants to anxiety, ADHD, bipolar meds, anger, and, you know, and sleeping pills to help myself fall asleep. But I found that one why, you know, why I'll get to. But all that help that I asked for wasn't working because I didn't accept it. Every time I felt good, you know, I don't need the medication. I don't need, you know, those counseling appointments. I can do it on my own. Every time I saw, or I went one month, you know, two, three, nine months sober, I would see someone else doing it. And then that thought came back. Well, if you can do it, I can do it. I'm just as smart as you. Well, every time I had a drink, I proved how smart I wasn't. <laughs> And I would black out and then all of a sudden I'd miss time at work and then miss time with my son. So I met a girl and we dated on and off, but eventually, you know, my drinking, she couldn't handle. We broke up and then, you know, we kept in touch and, you know, we hung out a couple of times and eventually she said, Justin, I need to tell you something. And she's like, I'm pregnant. Now you don't have to be in this child's life, but I'm having a baby. And I'm like, okay, no way. I'm going to be in this child's life. Absolutely. So we got back together and I ended up getting in a, a car accident, drinking and driving. And I'm just like, geez, man, you got a kid coming. What are you doing? I'm like, I go to rehab. So I went to rehab for the very first time. However, when I went to rehab, I went for the very wrong reasons. I went to get out of town. You know, I thought I went for my kid, but I actually, I was embarrassed that I just, Caught in this car accident. I was on, I'm from Salmon Arm, which is a very small town. It's like 20,000 people. Well, I know a lot of people here from working in a nightclub, growing up in sports, working at the sports store, working at the mill. So I know a lot of people. People have passed me on the highway. Cops were there. And like, it was, it was embarrassing. So I'm like, okay, well, I got to do something. But when I was there, you know, I, I went to the gym twice a day. I, I got, you know, I worked. Like, I went to my classes, but, you know, I went and I got big. Right? You know, I and ate a lot. I did, did it for the wrong reason. So when I got out, though, the first thing I said to my uncle was, you know, I'm not done drinking forever. And great. Well, what a mindset is that? You know, I just left my pregnant girlfriend who is due any day. And the first thing I do is when I got off, said, I'm not done drinking forever. Well, you can probably guess what happened. One month later, we have our son. You know, two months later, I start hitting the ball again and making poor decisions. And all of a sudden, six months later, she has to make the tough decision to pick up my son. And leave me at my lowest point, you know, and I, I don't blame her, right? I was in no shape to have a kid around. Now, at that time, I was actually off work on a leave of absence because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't keep my mental health together. You know, I was angry, confused, upset, lost, and I was suicidal. And, you know, I really couldn't keep my thoughts together. And one day I ended up in the hospital with alcohol poisoning for the third time, but it was the second time in two weeks. My ex decided to bring my son down for me and so I could see him. And I'll never forget the way he looked at me and what he said when he walked through those curtains. He's like, looked at me, he looked at his mom, he looked at me and he looked at his mom again. He's like, mommy, what's wrong with daddy? All right, then there it clicked, you know, I, I need to end this. I need to end this so he has a father that he deserves. You know, a father that's going to teach him the ways of life. Father that's, you know, when he falls, he's going to pick him up. Or when he falls, he puts his foot on him and is like, going to hold him down there just so he knows who the man is for a little bit, right? But ultimately, he picks him up and he teaches him the ways of life. Not a father who's going to, you know, be in the hospital, shaking, you know, 
arms going numb. You know, can't keep water in with IVs in his hands or in his arms. So I should just end it. You know, everyone's, they'll understand. You know, my family, they don't want to see me suffering anymore. My ex, she's smart, beautiful, intelligent. She'll find a, a great guy for him. And as for the two-year-old, you know what? He probably won't even remember me. So why don't you end it? Now, when you get into a mindset like that, I believe you start to tell yourself the world's biggest lie. And that is, is that it's better off without you. Truth is that this world is better off with you. You know, that you were created. I believe you are created on purpose for a purpose. Everybody has one. But this world also needs your possibilities, your capabilities, and it needs your smile. You know, I was very lucky or fortunate, I guess. I guess it wasn't really luck because I chose to do this. But I was listening to motivational speaking. And, you know, I was listening to guys like who I had no idea who they were at that time. I was listening to Les Brown, Eric Thomas, Inky Johnson, and Trent Shelton. And, you know, all these guys, I definitely know who they are now. <laughs> like some of the guys that I look up to, right? It's coming the guy that the way they speak and carry themselves is just, I'd love to be able to do that. And I'm starting to. But they all had something in common. It was like, find your why. Right? And so I start to ask myself, well, Justin, what is your why? Well, I started to look at that little boy again. And I started to reframe my thoughts from like, okay, well, what if instead of ending it, so he has a better dad, you know, you get better. So you become that dad, right? And I'm like, well, if I get better for him, I get better for me. If I get better for me, I can help other people. Now, a lot of people in your life are going to say, you know, you got to do it for yourself. You got to do it for yourself. Well, you know, you do. And I hope you can. But if you can't, you find your why, you grab a hold of it, and you take it with you everywhere. Because I can tell you this, everybody has one. 100% it's you, but when you find a why and you do it for something, it always comes back on you because I got better for my kid. I ultimately got better for myself because I got better for myself. You know, I um, was able to finally put my family back together, you know, have another daughter, you know, branch out and start being a speaker, a coach and a mental health advocate, but it, it took a lot to get there. The story that you just told us today I hate to say it, but so many people are going through that and they don't know what to do, right? That spiral, that feeling of hopelessness, right? It's so common and we need to do better as a culture, as people to learn how to heal and to learn how to ask for help because many people wait for that breaking point, that rock bottom. Then they say, oh, things need to change versus something feels wrong. What can I do right now? You would be in a totally different space mentally if you started to see something and you begun to change it. I'm packing out a few extra pounds. Well, I better go to the store and buy a cheesecake. Said no one ever. All right. That doesn't happen, right? We say, oh, I'm getting a little weight, right? Oh, it's it's, it's so hard to find time to work out, right? We give ourselves an excuse. We give ourselves a reason why we need it. This is a self-care cheesecake. I need this. It's going to make me feel better. And I'm using cheesecake, but you could put anything, you could put vodka, you could put drugs. This is it's just the item that's making you feel good. It's a dopamine hit. Yeah. And once you start to go down that that process and you're gonna find yourself in a place where you're gonna to start to question, can I get out of this? And the answer is yes, I can get out of it, but how much work is it gonna take me? It's gonna take me too much work. It's not worth it. I can't do it right? So then you are just going to keep on with what you're doing. And I'm telling you to press the brakes. And I'm going to tell you that if you're at that point where you feel like you're going downhill, you need to find someone who's going to help you push on those brakes because you might be afraid to push on those brakes by yourself. And you don't have to wait till you get to the bottom of the hill to finally say, oh, I should have pressed on the brakes a mile ago or when I was almost at the top. Many people, they wait. They wait for a reason to finally say, I need to make a change. But what if we had a reason? What if we had a purpose? We understood our why. We knew the power in our why. We knew the power in what we are capable of as humans, our human potential. How would that change the world? Because we grow up in a school system or an environment where kids are going to be kids. I understand that. But we don't look at people for what they can do. They look at people for who they are at that moment. They don't look at them when they're five the same way they're going to look at them at 25. We're looking at 70-year-old Justin or Michael 
oh, he's skinny. He's not a good shot on the basketball team. He walks funny. He talks funny. He has a high voice. That right there is just building a low self-esteem and it's going to cause us to form our mindset in a different way. And you said it, and I tell people this all the time. If you tell yourself something long enough, it becomes your truth, even if it's a lie. So you might say, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I don't need help. And yeah, eventually you're going to believe it, but you need someone to step in and you need someone to say, hey, this is what you need to do. And you had times when you had friends and associates that would step in and say, hey, I see something is wrong. Are you okay? Do you ever kick yourself in the foot for not listening to the first warning signs? Or do you find yourself that that was a good moment for you to learn about your story, about who you are, and then about mental health? So when I walked across that bridge at 24 and I asked myself, are you an alcoholic? I knew. I said no, but I knew. I knew deep down I was. I I remember that, that Justin, you are. But I said no. Now, the thing is, is that when you admit it, I have something I call my three days. Admit the problem. That is the truth for you. Accept it internally and then ask for help. Because if you don't accept it internally, that help ain't going to work. By truly admitting it, that means that you have to do something about it, right? And that's like, oh, man, what are you going to do about it? So I I denied it for so long, right? And then I got to the point where people were telling me, like, Justin, man, like, quit drinking. Like, I mean, there was that part where a friend is, quit drinking, you'll be fine. Well, that's not how it works. That's not how mental health works. Alcohol is a coping mechanism. It's the wrong coping mechanism. Unfortunately, millions of people use it the wrong way. I mean, like I, I'm not against drinking at all. Whoever wants to drink can drink, but there's not one morsel of good that it does for you, if we're being honest. I knew I, from a very young age I had to quit drinking, and my, it was ruining my relationships around me. Like it, my family, it took my kid and my partner. Luckily, I, I got them back three years later, right? Three years later, I had to get them back. But I would... At one point, I'd be like, man, why do they want me to quit drinking? This is what makes me feel better. Why do they want me to quit using drugs? Do they want me to suffer? So I went into victim mode. Like, why would you want me to give up the one thing that makes me feel better? This is about me. Yet I was tearing everything around me apart. I am very lucky. You know, I was losing jobs. You know, I was very lucky that at one job I was, they're like, Justin, you're going on short-term benefits. Go get help. I'm lucky they didn't let me go. And so, yeah, I wish, you know, that's a good question. I wish I would have listened, right? The thing is, when you don't have to take everybody's perspective, right, on life. But it's good to listen to it, right? Even if you think they're right or wrong, get their perspective. Because that's the one thing about asking for help and why sometimes I do still see a psychologist is because they can look into my blind spot. They look at what I'm not looking at because sometimes you have those horse blinders on. They're like, no way. My choice, my decision, I don't care what you think. But if enough people are coming up to you and saying, listen, you need to make a change. Well, you got to make that change. Or you got to hear them out, right? As tough as it is right, to ask for help, it's definitely going to be worth it. A friend of mine asked me, he's like, if you go back, would you change anything? You know, I'm like, no. I mean, I changed some of the decisions I made because I hurt some people. Absolutely. But I wouldn't change those dark days, those lonely nights that I went through because I don't have to, but I get to speak and inspire and encourage others to ask for help, to have hope, right? And to, you know, when they don't see light at the end of the tunnel, to to keep on walking, you know, to find purpose and meaning in their life. And it's funny that you brought up the purpose and meaning because, you know, everyone thinks that, you know, I've had coaching clients that are like, I just need to find my purpose. I'm like, because everyone puts purpose Like it has to be this grand old thing, right? It has to change. My purpose has to change the world. I had to realize that at one point, my purpose was to get sober. Then my purpose was to go to rehab. When I got out of rehab, I went, I was two weeks sober and I went and spoke to a group of kids. My purpose was to speak to those kids and it turned out to be my greater purpose. So maybe your purpose is to be a parent right now. Anything can be a purpose if you give it purpose, right? Because you never know. You know, I used to hate working at the mill. It was my purpose to feed my kid, give him medical and dental, roof over his head, and an education fund. But it's led me to where I am today. And they have not only 
supported me in getting help, but they have brought me in to speak nine different times to two of their mills so far, right? So when you think that you don't have your purpose yet, maybe you're living it, right? Maybe what you're doing right now is purpose until it builds you up for greater purpose. I like to think there's many purposes, almost like, you know, you have your outcome goals and your process goals. What if there's process purposes and outcome purposes? And so don't be discouraged if you don't have that grandioso purpose right now, because, you know, it can come. When you ask for help, I want you also to ask yourself for an opportunity to listen, because what I notice when people ask for help, they get an answer that they are uncomfortable with. Get used to being uncomfortable, because that is where you're going to experience some of the best growth in your life. What I see in your life might not be what you see. And you said it perfectly, right? We have those horse blinders on. We don't see our blind spots. Even I have coaches. I have mentors. I have people showing me, hey, you're doing this. Maybe do this. Yeah, I can keep doing what I'm doing, right? And I can have my level of success that I have today. But what if I want more in my life? What if I want to reach new heights or I want different things? I have to do something different. You just can't keep doing the same things and expect different results. Unless you're going to the gym, you're doing the same workout. Eventually, you're going to get a little bit of muscle mass. But how long is that going to take, right? How long is it going to take for something to break down because you're doing it ineffectively or inefficiently? So there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And some people, they like to get their hand burned, right? Don't touch the stove. It's hot. Don't put your hand in the fire. It's hot. Some people have to learn that way. But it doesn't mean that everyone has to learn that way. We can learn from other people's mistakes. We can learn from the wisdom of others. And we live in a culture where wisdom is treated as second rate, when it should be treated as something that we should be looking at primarily, right? Knowledge. If we just look at school, it's we're going to give you some knowledge. You have to retain that knowledge and you have to recite that knowledge back to us. And then after you do that, we're going to give you a grade. All right. That's school. There's nothing about wisdom there. Now, you might have a teacher who instills wisdom and talks about stories about their life far and few between. You might have parents that sit down and talk to you and express their life and different points in their life far and few between. Because we don't look at wisdom as being one of the primary educators for our youth. The culture that we're upbringing, we're not training them. We're just saying, well, go through the process. Well, the process is going to lead you maybe in a place where you feel hopeless. Maybe you find something to cope. So again, drugs, alcohol, cheesecake, those things, right? It might seem like a part of life, but it's just something that you have to learn. Do you put your hand in the fire and do you get burned or do you learn from the wisdom? And I say that because I want to go into a little bit of my background. Growing up, my dad was an alcoholic, so he would drink a 12 pack a night. That's what he did. And I remember one time I asked him, this is like in the 90s. So the, you know, like things weren't crazy expensive. So I think he bought some Heineken and the Heineken cost like $16 or something for the pack. And I asked him, I said, well, why did you buy this $16 case of Heineken where you can just get like a Budweiser that's like $7.84 or whatever it was, right? And then he says, well, it's a different alcohol or whatever. Like, like Like he said, you wouldn't understand basically. I was like, okay, but then I was just thinking like, why are you spending $16 on this also? And so he went down that process of being alcoholic and we told him, right, uh, fights with our mother, things like that, right? It was a lot of hardship growing up. And as a kid, you see that, right? You see the father figure, you see the man figure, especially if you're a man, you're going to look for another man to emulate. So when I was 20, I was like, well, all right, we got to go party, right? All right. Because we're right around that age. I was just about to turn 21. But I knew some friends that owned the bar. And so what we did was right before, I think it was like three months before I turned 21. I was like, all right, well, I guess we can go out. We can go have a good time. And we went out and we had a good time. And I said, this is so much fun. I'm having a blast. Everyone loves me. I love it. I'm going out. I'm dancing. I'm having a good time. I did that for about six months before I finally woke up and I said, I can't keep this up. I have to change. It wasn't a point where I got arrested or anything or something bad happened. It was just, I just started to have a flashback of all the things that happened in my life, my childhood, maybe from my father. And I said, the end goal 
where I would be in 40 years if I kept this up is I'm not going to be in a good place. So I stopped six months later. Fortunate. You. Fortunate, right? It's uh, my yeah. That. yeah. And what is so interesting is I had a good friend. His name is Lewis. And we worked together in the kitchen. Um, he owned a restaurant and we worked together for six years, him and I. We first met when I was 16. So he knew who I was. He saw I was going to school and then I went to college. And so he had high hopes for me, right? He knew my character. And so when he saw me drinking in my 20s and when I turned 21, he was like, I understand that type of thing. So he just kind of let it slide, right? He didn't say nothing to me. But it was at a point where he was like, I want to say something, but he didn't still. When I quit and I remember him and I, we had a conversation about it. I said, you know, I'm done going out and drinking and partying and just doing all this stuff. Like, I'm not going to do it no more. And then he says, I was worried about you. I was going to say something, but I knew you would get out of it. You were young. You were trying to experience new things. And I was young and I was trying to experience new things. But the fact that he knew something was wrong, didn't say anything. It didn't even hurt my feelings. It just made me more aware that I didn't even see it until someone knew it. So he knew it before me. So people can help you before you might know your truth or what's really going on. You know, having a strong mindset to get out of it by yourself, that's just from the family upbringing that I had. But not everyone has that strong support system. Some people, they're living in a single parent household and that parent is working to make ends meet. Keep a roof over your head, keep food in your belly. You don't have any support. So maybe you talk to your friends who put you down or you go to your video games to try to escape reality, but you need to figure out, well, what is life? And this is where I'm, I'm leading to our next question, our, our next talking point. What is the purpose and the value of life? You can take it any which way you want. What do you think life is? Oh, that's a big question. You know, and honestly... I, I think it's about helping others. I think that's the greatest purpose one can ever have because it brings two fulfillments. It brings one to them and brings one to you. And, you know, and, and we look and search for fulfillment through our whole life. And it can be as simple as, you know, opening a door for somebody, uh, you know, donating money to a charity, feeding the homeless, supporting your kid and their sports or there's anything is when you are willing to go beyond yourself and help somebody else that I think that is, is the greatest purpose that, uh, that one can have really. Now that doesn't mean putting their needs ahead of yours, right? There's a, there's a fine line there, right? You got to make sure that you are healthy and capable and in a spot to be able to do that. Because, you know, I like to tell my clients that a lot of them had are ha having a hard time putting themselves first, right? But when you stop taking care of your needs and you're given 60%, well, but you think you're given 100 So what is your 100% of your 60% that you're giving, right? You feel 60%, but you're giving 100%. That's still 60%. So if you want to be able to get into that spot where you're giving back and, you know, help and serve others, you, you really still need to take care of yourself too. It doesn't mean putting yourself first every single day, but it means doing stuff like your healthy coping mechanisms and keeping on track and if you can do one thing every day you know to take care of yourself and take a walk you know do some gratitude listen to a podcast read a book you know, do some journaling something like that then you can really fulfill the purpose of helping other people there is no greater fulfillment in there is than service right the service to others when people ask me that question what is the meaning or the purpose of life it's one of those ones where I answer that shocks people in the beginning, but then it makes sense in the end. And I say that life has no meaning or purpose. Life is the opportunity for us to create meaning and purpose. And I think sometimes people think that they have to rush to this purpose, but life is not something that you're, you know, we're racing to the finish line. I know when we're younger, we want to be teens and we want to be able to drive our car. And then eventually we want to be able to smoke or drink or do things without adults. But then it comes to a point is where you're now working and you have a career, maybe a family. You're probably not thinking about, I can't wait till I'm 65. 
it's one of those conversations that if you do think that you need to change your career because you just don't like what you're doing, right? You're waiting for retirement, the American dream type of mindset. We rush in the beginning especially parents, because we have that same type of mindset. I can't wait till my kid can hold their own bottle. I can't wait till they tie their own shoe. I can't wait till they can wipe their own booty. Yeah. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then they finally are going to be grown, leave the nest. I wish my son or my daughter would call me, right? We rush, we rush, we rush, we rush, and we don't pay attention. So life is the it's the opportunity to pay attention. And we have to be able to see that life has so many opportunities and it has also one of the greatest opportunity for us to change who we are. If we're on a path and we don't like it, pivot, change. If you don't know that you're on the wrong path, you need to surround yourself with people who can help you see where you're going. There's a cause and effect to everything. If you punch someone in the face, most likely you're going to get punched back in the face, right? There's a cause and effect, right? And we can give many examples on that, but learn your habits and learn what type of habits are going to bring you closer to your goals, your dreams, your ambitions. Because if you just find yourself always in the loop-de-loop -loop of everything, you're going to find yourself on the other end unhappy and at rock bottom, right? And if we can mitigate as many people who are going on that bad path downhill to that rock bottom, the world is going to start to change drastically. And then you're going to see more service, more people caring about each other, bring back chivalry. Right now, everyone is so singular. Everyone is so internalized, right? What can I do for me? What do I need, right? What's going to make me feel better? You even said it, right? This makes me feel good, right? Why are they trying to take this away from me, right? We have that I mentality versus a tribe-like mentality. And so what I want to ask you is how can we start to build a community of people who work together, who collaborate and want to see each other? succeed and thrive and to not only find their purpose and why, but to give themselves a reason to be more each and every day? That's a good question. Uh, I just wanted to touch on how you, I liked how you say we create purpose and you talk about opportunities. And, you know, when I graduated, I had, I was given opportunity, right? To do whatever I wanted with my life. And I was at the top of that tree and I fell from that tree and I hit every single branch on the way down. And then I landed on rock bottom. And from rock bottom, I created a purpose, right? So I 100% agree with you. You create a purpose. And it, it took, I hit every branch. I landed on rock bottom and I created a purpose out of that. So, you know, when people think I need to find a purpose, go and create one, right? Just create it. Now, how do we create that tribe? Well, you know, I did a, a coaching course through a lady named Kim Summers Egglesley. And she said, hang out with people that sue you that support, uplift, and encourage you, but also tell you the truth, right? It's getting around, it's meeting people online. And it's funny because people be like, oh, how do you know that person? And I'll always start this conversation. So I met this guy online, right? <laughs> like I have a family. So people be like, what, you met a guy online? I'm like, yeah, I met a lot of guys online. But not, it's not being afraid to go out and search for people like you, joining groups on Facebook of, People like you that have the same goals, same ambitions, you know, maybe the same struggles as you, because I've made a lot of friends through joining groups on Facebook to that help support me. I just spent six months down at the Ronald McDonald house for the birth of my daughter. She needed a couple surgeries when she was born. And when we were down there, some of the people that I met online that I've never met face to face would send us, you know, gift cards for dinners or like flowers and stuff like that. So when you want to create a tribe, you go out. It's, it's hard to sit back and create that tribe. It's getting out of your comfort zone, like you said, finding those groups, listening to those podcasts, getting out into the community and looking for people like you that you can help. Volunteering, you know, in youth athletics, you know, maybe volunteering at your church or volunteering at um, a thrift store. You know, I, I volunteered at a thrift store and it was one of the funnest times I got to work with a kid with Down syndrome and our daughter has Down syndrome. Amazing, amazing guy to work with. You get to see a bunch of people, but you're also doing good, right? Although I had, it's funny though, I have tattoos and you know, one of the ladies looked over at me because I'd never been there before. She's like, so, so, so how many hours do you have to do? I'm like, what do you mean how many hours do I have to do? She thought I was doing community service. <laughs> she thought I was a criminal or something like that. Like I was forced to be there, but I wasn't. But it's going out and putting yourselves in those uncomfortable positions 
and really like like we talked about before getting ready to serve and help other people that you can really build those communities and you know making it a priority to me i agree with you going out volunteering being present right i think sometimes people they give themselves their home and they say well this would be nice right but they don't do any action right we have to have some action in what we're trying to go for we might give ourselves a thought but just because we have that thought it doesn't mean it's going to come to life right it's not going to come to our reality because you can think all day but it doesn't mean at the end of the day something happened so we need to make sure that we can begin to take more action right and we need to learn how to take immediate action too. If something is going wrong, don't wait, right? If you get shot, you're not going to say, oh, I got shot and then not go to the hospital to get it sewn up or to stop the bleeding, right? Because you will slowly drain all of your blood out of your body, right? So there has to be some type of urgency that's happening. And I want everyone who's listening to this to understand the urgency in your life. You might be barely staying afloat right now with whatever, right? Your career, your relationship, your mental health, your state of being, and you feel like you're about to sink, call for help, ask for help. Don't wait until the last minute where you're underwater and then someone hopefully can see you and and jump in to save you. We have to sometimes be our own heroes of our story, not our enemies, right? We we have to look at ourselves as the capable person. I can do this. I can make some changes versus, well, someone's going to come save me, right? Things are going to go my way in the future, right? We need to create those paths. We need to create those types of mindsets. It's easy to play the blame game. It's easy to say, I'm, I'm here because of this person or because of this circumstance. We need to rise above that. We need to be bigger than the reasons that life has given us, right? We have so much potential. Trent Shelton said, he said, you can blame and complain or accept and change. And that's what we have to do. We have to begin that change. And today's episode is just that start, right? It's that change in your mindset, the change in your behavior, the change in the way you think. Because if you can change your actions, then you're going to change the results that you get. You know, I'm so happy that I was able to reach out to you, Justin, and get you on to speak about what you do and how you help people. Because again, I hate to say it, a lot of people are going through it right now and they're looking for help. They just don't know how to ask. They don't know where to look. And the work that you do is amazing because it's offering many of the answers that those same people are looking for. So I do want you to give us some last words, and then I want you to tell the audience where they can find you. Well, you know, when you say or you think that you're alone, you actually aren't. The World Health Organization, I just read a stat, one in nine people struggle with mental illness in their life. That's you know, it was over that. So there's like 950 million people in this world, almost a billion people will struggle with some sort of mental illness. Now, one out of five people actually have a, will have a mental health episode at some point in their life. That's half the world, basically. So I learned a stat in mental health first aid, and that's five out of five people have mental health. You know, everybody in the world has some sort of, has mental health, but everybody has different experiences and different traumas and ways on how they cope with their mental health. And that's why it's very important to be kind to everybody because you don't just don't know what they're going through that day. They could have been diagnosed with mental illness. Maybe they lost a loved one. Maybe they forgot to take their medication. Maybe they're dealing with generational trauma. So that's why it's imperative to be kind to everybody because you don't know their story. And they might be trying their hardest to keep it together that day. But everybody has a story. Everybody's story is just as unique and everybody's story is just as important. So ask for help. And believe and know deep down that you deserve to be happy and that you deserve to flourish. You can reach me at uh, on my website, www.justinbryan.com. Instagram, justinbryan19. TikTok, Justin Inspiration. And pay attention and look for a book that I'm in the works. It's almost it's almost done. I keep saying it's done and just in the midst of getting an editor, but I always keep going back and you know adding tidbits here, tidbits there. But it should be out uh, late March called Chasing Shadows. So look for that to come out. And if you're looking for a speaker, I travel. If any of this resonated with you or if you got anything out of it or you had an aha moment, I would love to hear it. Uh, you can email me at justin at justinbryan.com and I would love to hear what you had to say.
Awesome. And I will throw all those links in the description box below so people can easily find you, reach out to you, follow you on all your socials, reach out to you if they're looking for a speaker for an event or for a school. Because the work that you do, again, is helping people understand that their life has value, that they can create meaning. And we all have a story to tell. We just have to be brave enough to tell it because the people who listen will appreciate it. You might think that your story doesn't have any significance, but I do want you to understand that you have something that no one else can bring, right? You have your uniqueness. So that story that you tell is one of a kind. So don't let the ending be something that people will never know. Share your story, share your wisdom, share the opportunities that you have learned with others so you can begin to make some changes in the world. Be it small today, it creates compounding effects for the future that are going to be big results. So I want to thank you so much, Justin, Brian, for coming on Coaching in Session. I loved everything we talked about. Perfect. Hey, you know what? Thank you for having me. I'm glad we could put this together. And I hope your listeners got some great value out of it. Oh, they did. I need a hero, cause I got serious.